Welcome to a special edition podcast where we have a conversation with winner of a 2022 Sir William Stoker Award, Professor Christian Drosten, who's joining us here. Thank you for being with us, Christian, and congratulations to your award. Thank you, and uh, also thanks for having me. So I was wondering if we could get started um, and if you could give us a short introduction about yourself and what you do. Yeah, my name is Christian Drosten. I'm uh, the director of the Institute of Virology at Charité Medical Center in the center of Berlin, Germany. And uh, well, this is a university medical place um, where the Department of Virology is doing experimental research, but also overlooking um, patient care, the virological testing. We have a special laboratory for this um, big um, organization that looks after a large number of hospital beds, not only in Charité Medical Center, but also in the um, in the city of Berlin and, and beyond. Um, and I'm somehow on two positions there. So one is to, to be responsible for the diagnostics and the other is to run a university research institute. Great. Um, so I was wondering how you first became interested in science. Mm, I, I guess I was interested in science uh, as, as long as I can remember ever since. Uh, but I mean, it became serious when I was somewhat in the middle of my medical studies at the university. Um, and at, at, by that time, I, I already had made quite some contact with people treating patients. So I was volunteering and, and later also working on an intensive care unit and so on. And that was a time when I, I, I wouldn't say I became a little bit depressed by, by seeing the, the fate of patients and how severe diseases can be and how people die. But somehow I, I took this back home every time I worked at the hospital. And this was a, about the time when I got to know my later PhD supervisor or thesis supervisor. Um, and this really opened up for me a perspective into molecular biology. And, and this was an absolutely fascinating new universe to discover enzymes and so on. So this was really the, the classical old style molecular virology teaching, uh, molecular biology, like restriction enzymes and these things. Um, yeah, and, and so the, I, I didn't really actively take the decision, but I more and more got into this by being fascinated. And this somehow also led me into um, making a thesis in this area rather than on surgical procedures or uh, ventilator protocols or something. I worked on uh, PCR for hepatitis C virus. This was actually the, the introduction, but then the whole thing developed a little bit in a different way. Um, so the overall topic of my thesis was testing for viruses in a blood donor screening setting. But it turns out HCV, you can buy methods for, for testing while um, there are no methods for high throughput testing for hepatitis B and HIV. So this is what I spent my my investment in, uh, in, in the lab in my, my, my thesis. Um, and this was then really introduced in, in routine blood donor screening. Quite an interesting experience to, to make a research and development project and see this introduced in, in patient care. And this all of this process was so engaging um, that I never thought about alternatives. I just stayed with it. Mm, yeah, that's great. And maybe something a lot of virologists can um, emphasize with. And so was it more just like a, an interest in like the basics of molecular biology and the complexity behind that rather than like a specific virus that drew you in then if at first you're working on hepatitis C and then moving on to other viruses? Yeah, this is uh, so I'm, I'm not coming from a particular virus, but I'm I'm a physician, right? So I'm coming from a patient care perspective. And so this is diagnostic testing. And, and when I started, um, real-time PCR was the hot new methodology, right? No, no lab in the country had a real-time PCR machine. And we, we had one of the first ones. And 
So um, this is a this is a natural um, door that opens into clinical virology. Of course, if you can, if you if you can not only test for the presence or absence of virus, but at the same time have viral load information, right? So a new parameter. And I I looked at virology from this angle over quite a number of years in, in the beginning of my career. So. Um, moving to more exotic tropical viruses and asking whether viral load could be a predictor of, of disease, uh, disease severity in these diseases as well, where, where this information wasn't known at all. Um, also, how long it takes to get rid of a virus that's as rare as, let's say, Lassa fever, right? Lassa, Lassa virus. Um, yeah, so to... to um, somehow virologically accompany or supervise cases of rare virus infections. This was quite fascinating for a number of years for me. Um, during your career, you worked in quite a few different places. Mm -hmm. How important do you see the importance of moving around in science? I think it is important. So um, to, to have the experience of getting to know another environment, to see how things are managed in a different place. This is really important. Um, of course, there are trade-offs, right? It's, uh, so I, I really see this as a challenge for families, right? So Germany, for instance, is, is quite a large country and um, people moving away from grandparents, then having children and discovering that there is no help with childcare. I think is a real challenge and something that many societies, in, including Germany, haven't really found a good response for. So we have this problem of, of childcare, of, uh, of uh, let's say, combined careers of, of men and, and, and women. Um, then we have this problem of loneliness of old people. and. Right, the, all of this has a combined reason of families being torn apart by career expectations. Actually, so I, I do not see this only in a, in a positive light, but it is necessary to make your experiences. Um, for the from from this, and your partner is also a scientist, mm -hmm. if I understand correctly. So, how did you try to balance? the two careers while well, still having a family? We are still trying to balance th this. It's a, it's a continuing challenge. Um, so it works for us. Um, we, uh, yeah, we arrange this uh, by having additional help and support, by having uh, childcare and so on. Um, and obviously, by, when, when you move places, because Uh, one of the partners um, has a, let's say, a, a good career opportunity, you can, of course, speak to the employer and see whether arrangements can be made. And this often is particularly easy if, if both partners are scientists, because then it's one organization that you have to speak to. Um, it's much more challenging if, if you're from completely different fields. Doing your work on imaginal virus has, this has clearly put you in a very prominent position. Um, in the media. Um, how did you find this new position in the center spotlight, in the limelight, mm. and during such an important time? Yeah, I mean, just... when the pandemic came, I, I'm, I was completely clear about the, the situation that there, there is a pandemic coming and, and that this is an, um, let's say, a, a unique societal challenge. And I was really like, okay, what, how can I make most use of my training or my, uh, my, my knowledge? And my decision clearly was what, what's really needed is um, uh, information for the public, for the normal uh, people who are seeking information. I mean, there is always a big part of the population who doesn't care, but there is a part who's, that seeks in information. And it's uh, really difficult to understand this complex and also developing situation for the normal population. So I, I was quite aware about this and I, I very consciously decided to make this a project for myself and really abandon intense research work for 
a number of months in favor of uh, informing the public. This was the, the conscious part of it, but then things happened that I didn't expect, right? Um, I, I never expected that there, there would develop a, a level of public attention that puts myself in, in a position like a, a prom, right? Somebody who is known by the normal people and you go to a supermarket and people recognize you and I don't know, uh, like or hate you. Um, and then media somehow, uh, yeah, pr reproducing what you say in a, in a, in a, yeah, in a way that, uh, that you don't like, right? That, that's uh, sending the wrong message, a message you never sent, but a, a picture that is created on, on purpose, intentionally. So you, you are, you are, you can become a figure, like a caricature of yourself, um, just because you're in the media. And this is, well, for me, it's sometimes a bit frightening when I start to project this to other fields. So I, I begin to ask myself, is actually the information that we obtain about politics, for instance, and about politicians, is this going through the same lens? Is this distorted in the same way? Um, if so, then I, I'm not sure whether I feel well informed as a citizen. So it's, a, it's an interesting glimpse behind uh, a curtain that you never, um, well, that you can never uh, access, right? It's, uh, yeah. How did you try to cope with all this new kind of input during this period yeah yeah i mean if, if you are really in a in a situation of being very much exposed in in the public yeah. including phenomena like the one i just described you need a, a a good surrounding in your private life and you need a good professional surrounding i i, I was fortunate enough to have both um so this went well for me and uh, and for my I don't know emotions, I think I um, I'm coping quite well with this, and I I, th I also think um, that nobody really succeeded in somehow um, attacking me as a person um, or destroying my I don't know what my public appearance, um, even though there were really severe attempts to to do that. Um, what was your impression following on from this, on the impact on your lab, on the people working with you? Because they must have noticed that you're now very busy with all this and also all the media attention. Yeah, yeah, this is true. So um, I'm, I'm sure the lab suffered. Um, so I've, uh, I've certainly, um, during this time, that was much longer than I expected, right? I, I expected like a few months, but it turned out to be like f two full years. And the, and I'm still somehow, uh, yeah, pulling out of it. It's, a, it's really a process. You can't stop from one day to the other. Okay. Um, but but I have, I've been engaged less and less in the public some, somehow with the advent of the Omicron BA2 wave, when sun, somehow it it really came to show that the burden on the population is, is much reduced and that the issue is becoming less and less an issue of public attention. So that this was somehow the opportunity that, that I could use to, to retract. And um, the lab, well, two years, um, so I, I wouldn't say the lab was in autopilot m mode. I, I still had lab meetings during the whole time. Um, but it's a big difference whether you can really focus on the things or whether you are using the resources that you've built up in, in years before and your very professional uh, people that you have in the lab, um, you, you just rely on them, right? Um, this is what I had to do for about two years. and. Um, yeah, I, we, we would certainly have been more productive as a group. We would certainly have attracted more external funding if, if everybody, including myself, had been on the matter in the lab. Um, 
But still, looking back, I think it was the right decision and it's also not going to kill our research. It's only slowing us down temporarily, but we will be back. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, I think it, it, it was a historical time. I'm, I'm quite convinced that I, I will not um, live through the same thing again until my retirement, um, which is probably also an epidemiological perspective that many people share. It's not like a pandemic is around the corner every 10 years. This is not just not the case. Very good to hear a bit of this <laughs> <Yeah>. one. <laughs> That's great to hear. Um, yeah, I think it's an incredibly important thing to get involved with, with it, communicating with the public, especially at such a time, as you said. Um, but I wonder if we could dive into a bit more of the basic research you mm -hmm. did. Um, you've had a really successful career already from helping to discover SARS-CoV-1, producing um, a clinical test for SARS-CoV-2 and working on MERS. But I was wondering what your favorite discovery that you have made is. Well, I mean, the most important and, and also favorite thing certainly is, is the SARS-1 discovery, right? Um, this was a so if you say co-discovery, it's, it's three groups internationally, CDC Atlanta, University of Hong Kong and, and ourselves um, finding the same, coming to the same conclusion within one week, basically. And this was a, a completely original type of research that still was very much in, in my original background, clinical virology, old days, virus discovery, early days, technology. Uh, random prime PCR cutting bands out of the jail, right? Long before the the advent of next generation sequencing, um, that was both fun to do and important. Um, and then, well, the, the diagnostic tools that came out of it, the, the application, the distribution of a PCR test via, let's say, um, early days internet connectivity and so long before Twitter and anything was invented, working on mailing lists, um, that was quite fun to do. Yeah. yeah, it sounds quite different to how research happens now. Um, so would you mind going a little more into like the background of that discovery um, and why it's important? Well, I mean, this was a coronavirus like the, the present SARS-2 coronavirus. Um, we, we don't officially call it SARS-1, but it was SARS-1. Um, and it started off in a, in a very similar way, right? So it, it was a uh, virus epidemic that spread um, internationally. So we, there were cases in Asia, but also in North America and Europe. Um, and the virus fortunately had less capability to, to be transmitted from human to human. But one has to say that the whole thing was actively suppressed by public health interventions, um, diagnostic methodology set up in national public health labs and then sub-national public health labs in short time and case identification, isolation measures, and um, probably activities that led to the prevention of further human adaptation of the virus. And if that had happened, as we see uh, now with SARS-2, how flexible these viruses are, um, this might have been a, a pandemic, might have turned into a, a pandemic within a few more weeks or months. Yeah, that's really interesting to hear, actually. And so do you think that if um, the public health measures had been a bit slower, then it could have been a pandemic? Or do you put it down more to the virus? And we learned in your seminar today about like the deleterious mutations. Yeah, in. well, th there is certainly um, a virus component. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I explained this in the, in the talk today, there was a deletion in the genome early in the human to human transmission chain in China. Um, and the virus that left China probably had a deleterious trait so it was slowed down naturally, but there was also a part of the virus population within China that didn't have this trait. And especially in China, and if you consider Beijing, they did quite um, effective and uh, aggressive control measures. I remember being in Beijing during the outbreak and the streets were empty. So this was a, I wouldn't say a lockdown 
situation like like TV images we have from Wuhan now in uh, in spring 2020. But this was quite a, a public health intervention already, and uh, I guess we could have had a pandemic if this had been um, going on without any control and intervention for a few weeks or months. Going a bit in the opposite direction now. Was there at some point in your scientific career where you thought you should have pursued a question or a problem more directly, which you kind of missed out on? Mm, yeah, certainly. The, the, I mean, there are papers that were never written up. Um, there are even manuscripts that were never submitted. This, All of this accumulates once you do research in, a, in, a, in an active way with a larger and larger group. Um, and yeah, I regret to have been slow on many things so uh, but but this is something you can't prevent you can't do anything so one thing i i i regret regret is we we had a very good collaboration on rna virus diversity in insects and uh, it was us not our insect ex expert partners who were slow looking at the transcriptome data but because we just didn't i didn't prioritize in the right way and so others Uh, published the first descriptions of uh, RNA virus diversity in insects. Um, we could have done that because we started quite early, uh, but we lost years and years of time because we actually basically because of MERS. Um, so if you have a have so many group people in the group, you can only do so many things at a time. Um, moving a bit on from this now and going a bit broader, um, based in your on your experience in emerging viruses and the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, what do you think should we do to be better prepared if something similar is occurring again? Yeah, so I, I guess if you really consider virus emergence from animal reservoirs, one thing that uh, I have sometimes have the impression is not clear enough by now is that it is livestock. It's not wild animals. So there is not enough contact between humans and wild animals if you compare this with the contact surface between humans and livestock. We eat livestock, we breed livestock, and we are in the middle of livestock. And there is too little livestock surveillance in the countries of origin. There is some livestock surveillance over here, um, but I mean, the, the proximity and the bridge function of livestock towards wildlife is in place in countries that are less developed and in less developed countries who struggle to convince governments to invest into human public health. Even more um, is it a challenge to convince governments to invest in animal disease surveillance. But this is the dimension. It has to happen on a governmental scale. It's not a, a thing for research projects. Research projects can only stimulate things, but actually it's a surveillance task. You had quite a lot of experience with the media and the press. Mm -hmm. And obviously that came to, in particular with scientific outreach, there's a lot of more scientists come in contact with the media. What sort of advice would you give those people who are just starting out on the journey with interaction with the media? Yeah, it's it's a difficult thing because, I'm, I mean, it, it might look like I'm very professional um, with this, but I'm not. Um, I'm also a yeah an outsider in the in the media world um and it's i think it's it's not very helpful if if i say oh, okay you have to be very cautious about what you say and so on and um always think about how how things that you say can be scandalized or taken out of context because this is what media will try to do because they run a business and their uh, their good that they are selling is attention so that's a, a thing that we as scientists actually do not know, right? So we are trying to be, um, let's say, except some things that sometimes also happen in, in science. Um, actually, we are trying to be um, on the spot. And if things take longer and if, if a message has to be more complex, we are actually proud of having a much more complex message, right? So we are yeah. trying to sell the long story and the complete story. And we are proud of, I don't know, if, if a, 
if a thing takes is, is really complicated, we think we are very clever. We are the, the most complicated scientists and this is how science should be, complicated. But this is not at all how public uh, media work. So what, what they can only say sell is a simple story. And translated to science communication, this is a simplified story. And this, this is actually the, the biggest challenge in science com, com, uh, communication to strike this balance between making things simple and making things wrong. Right? You can you can be simple down to a certain level, but below this it starts to become wrong. And the, the experience is as long as you stay in this above this threshold, um, it is also more difficult for the media to really abuse what you are saying. And what I discover in, in science communication sometimes is an oversimplification. So um, a scientist should never use slogans, never, never. So it's really like a scientist should not say things like uh, th these simple things like, oh, we'll have to live with the virus. Yeah, th this is true. But at the wrong time in the public, this is a highly misleading and also irresponsible message that is easy to be sold. By, by some media. And the question is, is there actually an intention behind this slogan? Why does the scientist use the slogan? Does he in the end want to sell a message to be or to become popular? And a scientist should not want to become popular. This is something that I I find really important because as as long as, as soon as popularity becomes your aim you stop being a scientist. It's These things do not go together. And it's a tempting offer that the media make. Once you somehow gain popularity, they try to lure you into their realm and make you somebody they can sell. And this you really have to strongly refuse. So basically, you have to be aware of the motivation of the media and your own motivation. Exactly. Throughout yeah, the you have process. to be very reflected about your own motivation. That's really interesting to hear. Something I discovered when I was um, preparing for this podcast was that one outcome of your new sort of popularity as a result of the pandemic um, was a punk band. ZSK <laughs> writing a song about you and your work. Um, how did that feel? Uh, nice. I, <laughs> I I like the song actually. Um, at, at the time it was released, I was too busy to even listen to it. So I really I had no time. Um, I just heard about it, and that was a time when I still followed Twitter, and it was all over Twitter somehow, in at least in Germany. And then the the band also came over to the institute and brought me a record and. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, there is still an open offer for for me to be on stage with them. Uh, so I, I play guitar and I could perform with them, but I I would need to practice. And also there, I'm currently I'm lacking the time. It's <laughs> <laughs> a really nice story there, um, and we look forward to the show. <laughs> um, so I guess going even broader now, um, what do you think the future of biology and virology looks like? I think one big thing is disease models, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we, the mouse models and all, and other small animal models, somehow tell only a part of the story, and we have to be on the human side. So this, this is the era of of organoids and organ models that um, will certainly improve. So I, I expect within ten years we'll have organoid models with immune system components. And that's when results will become more relevant, I hope. So this is one of the things I can say. Yeah, I think that's definitely um, where the future of biology is moving and sort of like personalized medicine as well, I suppose it's like it goes into that as well. Yeah, personalized medicine. One, another thing in the infectious diseases disciplines obviously is vaccination against a much broader spectrum of viral diseases or even bacterial diseases. Um, so to 
vaccinate away the common cold, I guess it's not a utopical thing. I, I guess it will be feasible. And this is, imagine the, the disease burden that you can reduce by offering every adult a, a broad range common cold vaccine. I would take it every year. Many people wouldn't, but many people would. And this would save, well, a lot of uh, also economic detriment that these diseases do to the to the whole of the society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think I noticed that as well over lockdown, not having a cold for almost a year. Yeah, it was lovely. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, um, what do you think makes a good scientist? Hmm. Yeah, well, a good scientist is somebody who always uh, doubts the first result and reproduces rather than publishes. Um, and somebody who who plans projects until the end that's also a good a sign of a good scientist um yeah and every i think everybody should be um self-critical about how these these ideals uh, can be met because i mean we all know that we are we like to be enthusiastic about initial data and how we like to be spontaneous in, in the lab uh, and just go without a, a big work plan. But in fact, um, this is what you should do. Mm, that's a really good advice. Um, a bit broader than this, but on a similar line, what would your advice be if somebody's just starting out a career in science, so like a PhD student? What would you advise them to kind of pursue, improve, what would your advice be? There are two ways that you can approach science. One is the, let's say, an existential thing. Um, you have to, you, you have a life beyond science. You you will have a family, so you will have to to have a salary, and you will have to work in an area where there is funding. So, let's say, working close to medicine is is a good uh, advice there because that's one of the foci of interest and the life sciences are, will be funded and, and are without any doubt are um, relevant to society, including to the economical parts of society. Um, the other consideration obviously is, is endeavor and excitement. Um, and that's where, well, probably science really lives so, um, to select a group of which you know they they have access to things that others can't do because they are working on a very high technical standard they have a well ex access to samples and so on so in in the life sciences for instance the the paleobiology field would, would be such an example right where um yeah it's where there is just pure fascination that will often not really inform um, uh, yeah, practical decisions, um, but where, yeah, where there is just discovery. Um, th that's of, of, obviously an, a strong motivation for, for young people, but it's a gamble, right? So um, my recommendation to, to young people would rather be also out of experience that you have a life beyond science and when you're excited about something at age 25 this may not be the same when you're 50. That's fair enough and going along those lines if you were a scientist what else would you do? If I weren't a scientist yeah. hmm, that's very difficult because I well I, I probably would work as a physician because I studied medicine and I always liked medicine and also there it was an intrinsic motivation so I I um, somehow ended up in medicine um, based on things I did before so this was based on civil service I did after school after school I had no concept of, of becoming a physician um, but then I, I did civil service in as an let's say assistant ambulance driver, emergency uh, um, ambulance driver, 
And this brought me into a fascination for anesthesiology and intensive care medicine based on the practicals I did in the hospital. And this brought me into medicine. So it, it was always like a, a sequence of steps, but not a strategic long-term decision. So it's difficult to say what I would have done. If, if, I, if I had followed my father, I would be a farmer by now which is also a good job, <laughs> but a difficult job in, uh, let's say, in, in a country like Germany. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, there's have been some really great answers um, and a really interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much.